السلام علیکم السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام جی ڈاکٹر جی آؤ اجازت ہے ڈاکٹر صاحب جی پلیز ڈاکٹر صاحب ہاں وہ محترم جو ہے پروفیسر زمان صاحب بھی آ گئے ہیں السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وعلیکم السلام و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ آواز آ رہی ہے سر جی آ رہی میری آ رہی ہے سر آپ کو ہاں جی آپ کو آپ کی آواز صاف ہے یہ کمپیوٹر ذرا سلو ہے اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ہے <تصفح> جزاکم اللہ خیر ڈاکٹر جنید نبی صاحب آیات قرآنیہ کی تلاوت فرما رہے تھے اب میں ڈاکٹر عطیق الظفر صاحب سے درخواست کروں گا کہ وہ چند افتتاحی کلمات اور ڈاکٹر اسد زمان صاحب کا تعارف کراتے ہوئے ڈاکٹر اسد زمان صاحب کو خطاب کی دعوت دیں جناب ڈاکٹر عطیق الظفر صاحب اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آج ہماری خوش قسمتی ہے کہ ڈاکٹر اسد زما صاحب ان شاء اللہ اس فورم سے خطاب کریں گے ڈاکٹر اسد زما صاحب ظاہر کے کسی تعارف کے محتاج نہیں ہیں اور شرکا میں سے بیشتر لوگ ان کے شاگرد کسی نہ کسی حیثیت میں ہیں اور خود خود مجھے بھی ان کے شاگرد ہونے کا شرف حاصل ہے ڈاکٹر اسد زما صاحب نے پاکستان سے ابتدائی تعلیم کراچی سے حاصل کی اور اس کے بعد یو ایس اے چلے گئے بوسٹن یونیورسٹی اور پھر وہاں سے اسٹینفرڈ یونیورسٹی سے بہت ہی ابتدائی عمر میں جب کہ ابھی لوگ اس بارے میں سوچنا شروع کرتے ہیں انہوں نے اپنی پی ایچ ڈی کی تکمیل کر لی تھی نائنٹین سیونٹی سیون میں اور اس کے بعد پھر یو ایس اے کی مختلف یونیورسٹیاں جس میں کولمبیا یونیورسٹی یونیورسٹی آف پینسلوانیا اور جان ہاپکنز یونیورسٹی میں تدریس کا فریضہ سر انجام دیا اور پھر ترکی میں بلکینٹ یونیورسٹی میں بھی کافی عرصہ پڑھایا اور پھر پاکستان میں لمس اور اس کے بعد ٹریپل آئی ای اور اس کے علاوہ اپلائڈ اکنامک ریسرچ سینٹر میں مختلف حیثیتوں میں خدمات سر انجام دی اور اس کے بعد پائڈ میں بحثیت وائس چانسلر جوائن کیا اور وہاں سے اسی حیثیت میں ریٹائر ہوئے ریٹائرمنٹ کے بعد بھی ڈاکٹر صاحب نے اپنی مشغولیات ترک نہیں کی ہیں اور اپنا جو ریسرچ کا کام ہے اور خاص طور پر اسلامک سائنسز کے حوالے سے مسلسل ان کی چیزیں سامنے آتی رہتی ہیں ڈاکٹر صاحب کے شاگردوں کا ایک وسیع کا ساری دنیا میں ہی موجود ہے جو ان کے خیالات سے مستفید ہوتا رہتا ہے آج کا جو موضوع ہے سوشل سائنسز کے ریفرنس سے ڈاکٹر صاحب نے بات کرنی ہے ظاہر ہے کہ تمام سائنسز میں کچھ نہ کچھ نارمز اور ویلیوز کا دخل ہوتا ہے لیکن سوشل سائنسز بالخصوص جسے ہم کہیں کہ نارمیٹو سائنسز ہوتی ہیں اور جو موجودہ سائنسز جو دنیا بھر میں بھی اور پاکستان میں بھی پڑھائی جاتی ہیں وہ مغربی دنیا میں ڈیولپ ہوئی اور نتیجہ یہ ہے کہ جو ان کی ویلیوز تھیں ان کو انہوں نے ان ساری سائنسز میں بلٹ ان کیا ہوا ہے اور جو ماڈلز پیش کیے گئے وہ ان معاشروں کے لیے تو سوٹیبل ہیں لیکن دوسرے معاشرے جہاں پر کے اقدار مختلف ہیں ویلیوز مختلف ہیں مذہب مختلف ہے وہ چیزیں پوری طرح سے فٹ ان نہیں ہو پاتی اور نتیجہ یہ کہ ایک تضاد کی کیفیت پیدا ہوتی ہے تو آج ڈاکٹر اسد صاحب جو کہ ایک تمام علوم کا ایک گہری نظر سے مطالعہ کر کے اور اس کے بارے میں ایک اپنی سوچ رکھتے ہیں تو ان سے ہم سنیں گے 
کہ مغربی جو سوشل سائنسز ہیں ان میں کیا مسائل ہیں اور ان کو کس طرح سے دور کر کے ہم اپنے معاشرے کے لیے مفید بنا سکتے ہیں تو میں مزید وقت لیے بغیر درخواست کروں گا ڈاکٹر اسد زما صاحب سے کہ آج کے موضوع پر سامعین سے مفاتم ہوں ڈاکٹر اسد زما صاحب ہاں السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سب سے پہلے تو یہ طے کرنا ہے کہ بات انگریزی میں ہو کہ اردو میں ہو کیونکہ میں نے تو انگریزی میں ڈاکٹر صاحب فارنر بھی ہمارے پاس صحیح ہے دیٹ از واٹ آئی وانٹیڈ اور رائٹ تو آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو ایکسپلین اسٹارٹ بائی ایکسپلیننگ وائی اٹ از وائی دا ٹاپک دیٹ وی آر uh discussing is extremely important in my view this is the most important problem facing the ummah today and the problem is that social science makes a deceptive claim and the claim is that it is a science and uh because we in the islamic world have mostly been colonized and have colonized minds so uh we have uh accepted this western idea that the um uh, that the social science is a science just like physics chemistry and biology and of course we are all, all extremely impressed with the progress made in the physical sciences and so we believe that if the social science is of the same kind of knowledge then we have no choice but to accept it given that they have done such a great job in terms of advances in the physical sciences so um now the problem is that social sciences is not like physical sciences so this is a false claim being made by the west <clears throat> but the result of this claim is that all over the world european values are being taught disguised as objective science and so we have muslim teachers teaching to muslim students that the goal of life is to maximize pleasure so this is uh, really a tragedy uh and um in my view yani if we think about the global perspective that what is the need of the ummah at this time i think that this is one of the central problems that we face that due to colonization we have accepted western claims and social science really explains how is is a set of lessons extracted from the european experience and we have accepted it without um, without critical analysis because we are so overawed by western knowledge and we are trying to implement this in islamic societies the lessons of social sciences and they cannot be done because social science is not what it claims to be it's not a science even deeper social science is actually a religion this is going to be if you want to have a one sentence summary of what i am going to try to explain today social science is the religion of europe which replaced christianity and it is in di- direct opposition to both christianity and also islam and so uh economics is a part of this religion so economics is also a religion and in studying economics we are teaching the religion of secular modernity which teaches the worship of wealth and pleasure power and profits and this is obviously not compatible with islam so that is that is a very short summary of what i would like to say now i would like to so 
the problem uh, the, why why is this important why it matters is because the social sciences were developed in the west and these are being taught all over the islamic world and so we are learning to shape our islamic societies according to european patterns but this cannot be done and it is causing tremendous harm so to take just one illustrative example of the harm that is caused by social science we have today modern money which has undergone evolution in the west and uh, it's changed the the role of, and uh, function of money changed in uh, uh, the course about four times very significantly in the uh, 20th century now the current forms have no analogy to anything that ever happened in the uh, ancient world. Ancient world meaning 100 years ago. So if we try to give rulings on modern money by using Qayas, uh, this will be illegitimate because it's Qayas Ma'al Farq. So what we need to do is develop genuine Ijtihad Given that the situation is completely different, we need to do something completely different. Now, one tendency is to say, okay, let's just accept the Western situation and modify it a little bit to make it Islamic. So this will not work because the Western institutions are based on fundamentally and radically different uh, structures of society. The other tendency is to take some of our ancient institutions and sort of uh, patch them up to modern forms without taking sufficient recognition of the differences. This will also fail. So, for example, if we say that, okay, uh, modern money is causing a lot of problems, let's go back to gold, dinar, and silver dirhams. This will also fail. So, we cannot go back to tradition and we cannot move forward to modernity. We have to develop an entirely new approach. So, uh, now I will start the talk proper and we can say that we have to understand that social science is based on European experiences. It's lessons extracted from European experience, experience and it is applicable only to Western societies. But uh, we fail to recognize this because of the illusion of Western expertise and intelligence. So uh, this, uh, this is the, these are the conclusions that I have arrived at after more than 20 years of thinking about this subject. And so I'm now presenting it to you in one shot, something which took me 20 years to understand. And so it will come as a shock and uh, it will seem like I'm making wild claims based on basically religious fervor. Many, many people have accused me of this, that because of uh, my tablighi background, that I just got the faith in my heart and the, it's the fire, the flame of Iman which is speaking and my uh, it is against reason. So, uh, let's just develop some I will give some arguments, but I will, uh, but what I mean to say is that the full uh, argument cannot be given in a short talk. So you'll just have to take my word that there is a lot of uh, material which is a supporting, uh, which is has to be done in support of this uh, claim that I'm making. But what, what is the claim I'm making? The claim I'm making is that this idea of Islamization of knowledge is wrong. Uh, the West does not have knowledge that we need to Islamize. Rather, we need to redevelop the knowledge on different foundations. And um, so social science is not a science, it is a religion. It was based on certain events that took place in the West, which caused them to reject God after life and day of judgment. So social science is directly based on the assumption that there is no God, there is no day of judgment, and there is no afterlife. Therefore, it emphasizes worldly life. So economic science is based on 
the assumption that every rational human being will uh, try to maximize pleasure. So anybody who doesn't, he is irrational. Like so, all Muslims are automatically irrational because our goal of life is not to maximize pleasure. Uh, similarly, the political science says that there is no gain from uh, obeying or, or uh, following or, or uh, committing to your word. There's no so their uh, political scientist Mike Machiavelli says that you can make si si promises and break them if it is needed for your interest and you can lie and you can deceive and you can torture, you can do anything you like. There are no moral codes uh, for the pursuit of power. And this is actually, if you look at the world around you, this is exactly the way politics is being done today. Machiavelli actually said that in, uh, the, in, on the face of it, you should be very appear very sincere and very compassionate and very committed. And behind the scenes, you can do anything you like because he said that if you say that I am cruel, uh, people will not like it. So you have to present a likable face and then you can do whatever you like. And you can see this happening all over the world. So this is the social science that we are learning and teaching to our Muslim students. So how can we understand this uh, social science? The first thing is to, uh, 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 to attach this label. that It is not social science because the science word says that it is applicable to all societies. We have to say that it is Western social science or European social science or Eurocentric social science. So in order to understand what I am saying, one has to look at European history from an external perspective, from an outsider. And this is not available easily. There is some material, but mostly it is Europeans writing about European history and they have an internal view. And uh, the internal view always glorifies the victor and uh, makes the, uh, the uh, losers appear to be inferior. So because Europe conquered the world in the 20th century, about uh, early 20th century, about 90% of the globe was under European control. So they got to write the stories about what happened. And these stories are very, very far from the truth. So for example, the simplest lie that we can easily see through is that the claim was made that we went out and conquered the world in order to bring the benefits of our advanced civilization to the rest of the world, not in order to rape and loot. So you can understand the, how this is a lie by just thinking about Iraq. Exactly the same line was used that we are going out to, get, get, to give democracy to the people and to free them from the clutches of an evil dictator. Whereas, in fact, it was all about the control of oil. So, very briefly, the external history that we want to tell, uh, which is relevant for my purpose, is that prior to the emergence of social science, there was a school of thought which were called the scholastics and schoolmen. These were all uh, priests and, and uh, people working in the churches. And they had a social theory. The social theory tells you what a society looks like, what people should do, how they should behave, how uh, towards each other, etc. But what happened was that there was a century of extremely violent, bloody, ruthless warfare between Catholics and Protestants in which families killed, yani, uh, brother was against brother. And this uh, led everybody to realize that Christianity could not be used as a basis for social theory. So Christianity was also, you see, we, we use the word deen for way of life and um, aqidah for uh, the personal belief system. So Christianity used to be both a deen and an aqidah. But the role of Christianity as aqidah was, as deen, 
was rejected by Europeans for obvious reasons because it led to a hundred years or more of war. So they said, obviously, Bible is not useful as a social theory. So we have to reject it and build a new theory. So this new theory was, uh, the claim was made that this is objective, universal. Why? Because they were fighting each other and they had to construct a social science which would be acceptable to all. And this was the problem in religion, that the Catholics said that my religion and Protestants said my religion and there was no agreement between the two. So they said, let's, let's build a science on neutral objective grounds. And this is why social science claims to be objective and neutral and value free. But this is false. So social science is a set of lessons about how to build a good society. A good society. Basically, it's purely normative based on a positive uh, analysis of the historical experience of Europe. And this is what all it can be. Obviously, if you're going to develop social science, you're going to do it by studying society. And the Europeans only had their own society to study. So they developed social science by studying their own society. But the problem is that the experience of Europe was extremely unusual and extremely different from the experience of Islamic societies, and also diff very different from all other societies. So the idea that the lesson from European historical experience applies to all societies is obviously false. And this can easily be seen by many different examples. So let's pass, instead of giving examples of why uh, social science is not universal, we take that for granted and we consider a deeper question, a meta question. Why do Western intellectual, intellectuals, who are obviously quite smart, make claims which are obviously false? Uh, so, for example, economic theory says that all human beings seek to maximize the pleasure. This is obviously false. Actually, human beings do not do that. Even yani, non-Muslims do not do that. Non, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that human beings value social relationships, friends and family, and they make sacrifices for this and they sacrifice the pleasure from consumption. And, and this has been shown by behavioral economists. So the question, the meta question is, how is it that Europeans who are very intelligent uh, make such obviously stupid claims that our science applies to all societies when it obviously doesn't. Well, um, the um, first thing we have to resolve in order to understand this is that we have a problem in understanding uh, this issue that how can someone who is extremely intelligent say something extremely stupid at the same time. And this is, uh, the, this is called the problem of cognitive dissonance. When these people are making such brilliant discoveries in, uh, in mathematics and in physics and in chemistry, can they really be very stupid in social science? So we, don't, we find this very, very hard to believe. So we say that, well, it's so complex and it's so mathematical, uh, I must uh, have misunderstood it. So actually complicated mathematics is used to hide very stupid theories. So the key uh, message of this entire talk can be summarized by uh, this verse from Iqbal, that my eyes were not dazzled by the brilliance of the knowledge of the West because they were protected by the dust of Medina and Najaf, two centers of learning of Islam. So, currently, actually, there are many, many intellectuals in the Islamic world who have understood the deception that is social science. Hoi, hoi, hoi. All right, let's do a stop share. So, yeah, yeah. 
Green pen. Green pen. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. It's good. Castle project. The only castle. Me. Now, what I need to do is to um, run the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you want to advance, you can do it. Yes, that's right. Okay, it's going. I learned that the screen was not being shared, so I have done it. Uh, is it visible now? Can somebody confirm? Yes, we are still on the first page, the first title page. It is not moving, I think. I have now uh, reshared the screen and it should be coming to the new screen now. Uh, on which slide? Which slide is on display, displayed on your... I am uh, now sharing the slide which has the uh, couplet from Iqbal. We still have the first slide. Uh, we still have the first slide. Yes, it's now, now it's... Okay, open. it's now it's available. It's just, it was just slow. All right. So let me proceed. So I think that even though this screen was not there, uh, I was conveying the message in words. And so what I was saying is that there, there is a, so we have to actually, the, the central problem of the Ummah is this idea of Islamization of knowledge. The, the West has knowledge, we do not. We need to get that knowledge. Actually, this, uh, the, the truth is that the knowledge that we have been given in the form of the Quran is given by God and it is much superior to any knowledge that any human beings can discover. Unfortunately, we Muslims have stopped believing this. This is, uh, I have covered this topic in uh, one of my uh, um, posts called uh, the modern Motzala. Uh, the ancient Mu'tazila believed that the Greek philosophy was equivalent to the Quran in terms of its value. And this uh, was a position that was eventually rejected by uh, Muslims. Today, the Muslims believe almost uniformly that Western knowledge is superior to the Quran. And this is reflected in our actions. What, uh, what do we teach our students? That, uh, what do we teach our children? We teach them all Western knowledge. They go through four years of university education with uh, barely one nominal Islamic studies course, which teaches them the four Qulhawallahs for at the end to memorize. And uh, so what will a student who is trained in this way uh, come to believe. He will believe that all relevant and useful knowledge was created by the West in the past three centuries and the Quran has nothing useful to offer us this time. And this is why I'm saying that this is the central problem facing the Ummah. We must recognize the illusion of Western knowledge that it is, it is very shiny but there is nothing behind it and we must... Uh, turn back to the Quran to build our own social sciences. All right, so very brief review of history. I hope that um, we started late and we this is a long talk, but I will try to go through it quickly. So first of all, the Europeans tell us, when they tell us their history, that the whole world was in darkness and the sun of reason show, uh, rose in the West in the 16th century. And we, we became enlightened. So they, this ended their dark ages. They never tell us 
how this happened. This is not part of their internal history. According to their own history, and for deeper reasons than I can explain in this short talk, they want to hide the source which uh, led, which, which uh, created the light in Europe when it is very obvious that it was the advanced civilization of Al-Andalus, which was for seven centuries uh, uh, right next to what was basically barbarians living in the West. Uh, but like uh, Ibn Khaldun said, every civilization uh, matures and decays and becomes senile. So this advanced civilization became wrapped and trapped in lux luxuries and they lost to the young and energetic barbarians uh, coming from Europe. And these Europeans then acquired the treasure of millions of books in the libraries of uh, Al-Undalus and they started a translation pro project in 1295 uh, in after the capture of Toledo. And this translation project, these books that were coming into Europe, they created the Enlightenment. And these books were in violent conflict with the Catholic Christianity. They were, so the church tried its best to suppress this knowledge. You, know, you all remember Galileo and many other cases where the church was trying to suppress this new knowledge. They call this in their history, the battle of science and religion. But it was not science and religion. It was the Islamic knowledge that was coming in from, the, from Spain that is the real battle, but they have hidden this source. So ultimately this led to breakup of the church because the new doc doctrines were not, uh, the church could not contain it. So basically the Catholic church split, split into Catholic Protestants and then they, they had centuries of fighting each other brutally and eventually if you know your um, uh, Max Weber said that basically it was Protestantism which absorbed some of the ideas from Islam and it was they who were able to break the stranglehold of the Catholic dogma and eventually make progress along the scientific lines that had been shown to them by the Islamic civilization. So, but in the West, what happened was that when they realized that you have to reject Christianity, then they said, okay, everything that everyone has believed was wrong. So now we have to rebuild knowledge starting from zero. Because previously they had taken the Bible as the foundation. The Bible is wrong. So uh, uh, they came to believe at least the Bible cannot be used for building a society because we have seen the results, they are terrible. So basically the enlightenment philosophers said that we must reject all tradition, all authority, all prior knowledge, and we must rebuild knowledge starting from zero. And uh, this is what the, um, this led to, uh, to a developments in epistemology, the theory of knowledge. How do you, what is knowledge? How do you construct knowledge? How can you be sure that the knowledge that you have is true? Uh, this was the central preoccupation of enlightenment philosophers. Unfortunately, the theory of knowledge which they derived is absolutely wrong and in directly in conflict with Islamic ideas about knowledge. And this deadly theory of knowledge is the basis of Western education. Uh, which we do not understand and recognize. According to this theory of knowledge, uh, in a nutshell, knowledge is only about external reality, about the world. So that's physics, chemistry, science, biology, the trees, the flowers, the animals, the movements of the stars. This is knowledge. But knowledge of my soul, my heart, my spirit, my feelings, human development, this is not knowledge. So uh, this, is the, this is the theory upon which the entire Western education is built. They don't actually teach epistemology in, in their schools, in, in the universities. 
But the epistemology is demonstrated. It's, it's hands-on learning. It's like the disciple he learns from the master. When they teach all the courses in universities, it's all about learning about external reality. Nobody tells you how to learn about yourself. This is the job of the Sufia. They teach you who you are, how you can be, what you were meant to be, how to create human potential. And uh, this is not part of the Western canon of knowledge. And this, unfortunately, because we have accepted their epistemology and we are forced to accept their epistemology because our educational system does that. It, it uh, gives us four years of training in chemistry, math, and, and biology. And there is not a single course on learning to develop your personality, how you can become a human being. So the fundamental problem is that it is impossible to build knowledge starting from zero, which is what the Western uh, tradition tried to do. All knowledge must be built on value, normative foundations. And this is was discovered by Imam al-Ghazali long time ago, and it is still not understood by Western intellectuals. They still claim that our knowledge is objective. Whereas if you probe the foundation, you find that all objective knowledge is built on moral foundations. And if you probe more deeply, you find that these moral foundations that they have used are toxic. They are very strongly in conflict with Islamic values. So I'm going to uh, skip over some slides because we are short of time. But basically, Europeans started their search by knowledge by saying that, okay, the only thing we can rely upon is uh, our eyes and our reason. That is what we can see and touch and what we can uh, reason. So this is actually something which is uh, on the face of it, on surface, it looks very reasonable, but actually it hides a very... Um, a very distorted perspective on life. This uh, philosophy is encapsulated in logical positivism, which emerged very strongly in the early 20th century. And this, uh, actually, there is a book by Julie Rubin called The Making of the Modern University. Um, intellectual transformation and the marginalization of morality. She says that in the early 20th century, if you look at the college catalog, it says that we are concerned with developing personalities. That's our main goal, that our students will come. We will teach them to become better persons. We will teach them to become leaders, to have civic and social responsibility. If uh, some of you remember, there used to be a subject called civics which has now been eliminated. Civics is exactly teaching about civic responsibility. These things were removed from education under the influence of logical positivism, which said that these things are no longer part of knowledge. So logical positivism actually had a fall in the 1970s. The philosophers who had invented this theory rejected it. They said this, this theory is not adequate. Because basically what the theory says is that you can only, uh, your knowledge is only about what can be seen, but science itself is based on the unseen, on um, electrons, on gravitational forces, on um, many, many things which are unobservable. And so basically, if you say, as logical positivists did, that all knowledge ultimately can be based only on what we can see and touch, uh, this, this is not a tenable philosophical position. But even though the philosophers rejected it, social science has not been revised to catch up with this uh, philosophical understanding. So on the basis of this positivism, the positivists said that ethics is meaningless. Why? Because what can you see uh, uh, if you say that it is wrong to kill? Show me a tree or an or, uh, animal which proves this. And there is no tree and no animal which can prove that ethics is true or false, an ethical statement. 
And so they said that this is meaningless. All morality is meaningless. And this is one of the lessons which is built into modern social science. So in brief, positivism says that science is the only valid source of knowledge and religion is pure superstition and ignorance. And this is, an, uh, and uh, knowledge is only of the external reality. And there is no knowledge of our internal reality. This is a personal matter. You can learn whatever you like about your ruh. Uh, we don't have any objections to that, but this is not part of human knowledge. So this denies one of the fundamental principles of Islam. And uh, so uh, this had an impact on university education. And so if I, if I say in my personal journey, when I, when I was a 16 year old and I was uh, studying at MIT, what did I need most? I needed guidance. What should I do? Uh, what should my goal of my life be? How should I devote my energies? I received no guidance. I was taught calculus, chemistry, um, history. And uh, even there was a course on contemporary moral philosophy. And what did this course teach us? It taught us that uh, uh, existentialism, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre philosophy, that uh, universe is meaningless. It was created by accident. We, our lives are meaningless. And um, whatever meaning is, there is, we must create. In uh, it, the, the philosophy of existentialism is summarized in the idea that existence precedes essence. That is, we came into being first, and then uh, we create the meanings. So we are all miniature gods because uh, there is no god, so there is no meaning to our life. And so we have, uh, if we want meaning, we have to create it ourselves. And basically, then um, the evolutionary theory teaches our students that we are just another form of animal. There is no morality. Society is like a jungle. Cutthroat competition and the survival of the fittest is the only organizational principle of society. And this is what social science is built on. These are the foundations. And we are teaching this poison to our students. There is explicit teaching of immorality. Um, there is a very famous lecture worth watching if you understand how sugar-coated poison is given to students. This Michael Sandel, he, uh, the, the video lecture is available on YouTube. He starts with the moral side of murder. And he explains that in some situations, this is a very famous problem, the trolley problem. It might be moral to murder one person. So why is he starting? Yani, there are lots of moral problems in the world today. Is it moral to uh, bomb Iraq, for example? And uh, yani, thousands of real practical uh, problems of morality. In, in the US students, is it, should you, if you make a promise, can you break it? Should you be faithful to your girlfriend, for example? These would be questions that the students in the US classes would be very interested in. But he starts with the hypothetical. That, and what is the object of this hypothetical? It is to show that even if you believe, and all students come in with this belief, the, the young, fresh, 16-year-old, uh, 17, 18-year-old, they believe that morality is good, that we should do the good, uh, we should do right, and we should do. So he's trying to break down this sense of morality by saying that, there are situations where everyone must kill. And so if there are situations that everyone must kill, so if, uh, either 1% is going to die or 5% are going to die. So you must, it's not that murder is wrong. It's that uh, it's, all, it's all relative. So morality is all relative to the situation. This is basically, and he says explicitly in this lecture, you may think that uh, by studying morality, you will become a better person, but you will not. <laughs> it's very interesting that he provides them with a warning that this is not going to make you a better person. It might do the opposite. And that's exactly what he is doing. So what is the impact on students? The students learn to pursue pleasure, power, profits without social constraints. And what is the impact of this on European society? We see that 50% of the students or more, more than that, are born to single mothers. The 
um, previously, you see uh, the critical difference in the um, idea uh, of marriage that has now become firmly planted in Europe and the West is that the purpose of marriage is to get pleasure from your partner. Whereas the correct uh, understanding of family is that this is a social unit and it has a responsibility to raise the children because that the future of the society depends on that. And the personal pleasure is a fringe benefit that Allah Ta'ala has given to make this job easy. But when you make the goal of marriage to pleasure, uh, to be pleasure as they have done, then at the first fight that you have with your wife, you just walk out. I'm not getting pleasure. So let me look for it elsewhere. And unfortunately, this attitude is being made into an ideal and, uh, and a desirable thing. And it is being spread by Hollywood movies and social media throughout the Islamic world. And we are seeing the effects of this, that the central purpose of marriage, which is to build a family to, to, uh, to create, uh, yani to, to bring up children who are well-trained, uh, this is, is being lost. Oops. Okay, so there is a clip I have. I don't know if I can make it work. Uh, anyway, there is a short clip in which isko chula sakte hain kya? Ye hai embedded video humare paas. It's a very short clip. We could get it to run. I don't know. Um, all right so it's okay uh, in this clip um, the uh, madeline albright is asked on uh, on a, actually a cbs um, interview that we killed half a million children in iraq that's more than we killed in vietnam so is it worth it so she said yes uh, it is worth it. So this is the civilization. This is what we call civilization. That it is permissible, it's worthwhile to kill half a million children to get the control of Iraqi or of the social science. She is trained in, in, in the social sciences. And similarly, there is a book, uh, many books which show how the products of the finest educational systems have done absolutely yani, barbaric things like killing millions knowingly, deliberately for the purpose of um, control, power, profits, because that's what Machiavelli taught them. This life is meaningless. There is no morality. You can do whatever you like. If you, uh, your goal is to pursue power and pleasure, and there is, there is no moral constraints. There are no social constraints. So the effects of these education are obvious. And you can see this in the actions of the leaders of the West who have been educated in this system. So forget about the West. Think about what happens on Islam. So basically, what is the impact of Western education on Muslim youth? Uh, they think, I, I was part of this Muslim youth. Uh, they think, I think, and uh, 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 my training led me to believe that all valuable knowledge has been created in the West. The Quran, the Sunnah, the Islamic intellectual tradition of a thousand years has nothing to offer me today for my modern life. Yes, on, uh, on the day of judgment, I can get to Jannah if I think about the Quran and the Sunnah. But in this world, I will derive no benefit from it. And if I want to make advance in the world, I must learn from the West. And if we want to build our society, we must use Western social science. So what is the antidote to this poison? Well, basically, we have to develop our own social science. And uh, uh, for a while, the ulama have uh, isolated themselves from the worldly sciences. That was all for a good reason and a, and a good cause. And it is not time to discuss nor to criticize this strategy. 
used by the ulama. And now actually the ulama are very well aware that they need to counter this isolation. Our original madrasas, all the uloom were taught. Uh, and even in India, we used to teach math and astronomy and navigation and shipbuilding and medicine and all available knowledge in the madrasas. For various reasons, which it is night time to go on, uh, not, there is no time to go into this. This was dropped. But now we urgently, urgently need to re enter this field because we need to develop our own social science to counter the poison that is being fed to the minds of our youth. But this is not at all an easy task. Not easy because we cannot just copy. And this has been actually one of the, I think this is one of the insights of the ulama that they have resisted this step that um, we should not teach computer science and economics and physics in our madrasas for a long time. They have been resisting because they have this instinctive and intuitive understanding that these sciences are not compatible with Islam. So that this is the reason for the Islamization of knowledge project, that we know that this economics that they are teaching, this um, political science, this is not Islamic. So what we need to do, uh, but, but we also understand at the same time that we need these things, that our uh, failure to teach these is, has left the field open to the uh, non-believers. Uh, and, and now the Europeans are imposing their political and economic structures on our societies, which are counter to Islam, like interest, for example. But uh, we don't have any alternative available. And so uh, the problem is that we cannot actually teach economics as it is. And we cannot afford to ignore economics. So we need to uh, bring it into the madrasa so that, but we need to modify it. And that's what the Islamization of knowledge is about. Uh, now, the problem is that uh, this knowledge, the social science cannot be Islamized. And so what we need to do is to build social science on the basis of our own intellectual tradition. We have a strong and deep, and it, it tells us what the rules of society are, what a rule of international trade are, what are the rules of how do we behave to our citizens, how do we behave towards the Zimmis, everything is spelled out very clearly. But we have, through um, our awe of Western knowledge, we have abandoned this tradition. So now this is what is needed. We need to rebuild this tradition. All right, so I, was, uh, I have several examples. So basically, the key spiritual problem is that today, because of our acceptance of the West as our leaders in knowledge, uh, we have denied the ayah of the Quran that the Quran offers us complete and perfect guidance. We say, no, the Quran is not complete because it doesn't offer us guidance in the economic realms. There we must borrow from the West. And also in politics, in social, in environmental, everywhere, we have to look to the West. So um, this is a problem. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to reject the Western social sciences, rebuild the knowledge on Islamic foundations. And the best place to start is a question which is not raised in Western education which is, what is the purpose of life? All knowledge must depend on the answer to this question. So I'll try to finish in five minutes so that there's 15 minutes available. So, um, although there's 15 slides left, but anyway. Um, so, if we want to create an alternative, this is what I'm saying, that we need to create an alternative education. Our education must start with the fundamental question, what is the purpose of life? Now, we don't need to be dogmatic about it. We don't need to say that our education is only for Muslims. Every human being needs a purpose. We say, okay, you want to be atheist? Be atheist. But when you say that I reject God, then tell me 
how you are going to live. Now, even among atheists, there are three shades. There is the existentialists, which I talked about, that we must create meaning. We must become mini gods. Then they are the absurdists. They say that this is a hopeless quest. We cannot create meaning. We must learn to live with the <clears throat> fact that life is absurd. There is no meaning. Then there are the nihilists, the people who say that yani Camus, Albert Camus, he said that in philosophy, there is only one meaning, one serious question, and that is suicide. Is it really worth living a meaningless life? What is it that would make a meaningless life worth living? So this is the nihilist position. So anyway, I'm saying that these should be discussed. Okay, so you choose to be atheist. Are you going to be existentialist or nihilist or uh, absurdist? And what are the alternatives on the table? There is also the agnostic. Maybe you don't like any of these positions because actually they, they all three are very tragic positions for a man to take. That there is no meaning to life. There is nothing, nothing I can do. So maybe agnosticism is a better position. How do, you, how do you know for sure that God doesn't exist? If you have a doubt about it, then uh, agnosticism is there. But if you are an agnostic, then the most important question in life becomes for you to find out if God exists or if God does not exist. Because your entire life depends on the answer. So search, how do we search for God? Then this is your first question. How do we find out for sure? whether God exists or whether he does not exist. And of course, the third position is deist, that yes, you believe in God. Then there is a search for religion, but I'm not going to go into that. But the point is that these questions, which are the most important questions in the life of every human being, every human being, whether or not he is Muslim, these are not taught, or discussed at all in university. So Western education offers no answers to these questions because it's built on the wrong foundation. It says that this, these questions are not part of knowledge. Why did we in the Islamic world accept this epistemology? Because our minds were conquered by colonization. And um, uh, we have acquired the Rushdi complex where one of his novels, he expressed contempt and hatred for his own family and culture. In Midnight Stendhal, he expressed contempt and hatred for his own nation and his people. And in Satanic Verses, he expresses contempt for his own religion and history and tradition. So this is uh, uh, the effect of a colonial education, which is going on today just as strongly as it was in the colonial time. That, so when people say that our minds have been colonized, then people say that, well, colonization ended long time ago. But the point is that our minds are colonized not by the rulers, but by the education that we receive. So basically, educational systems propagate Western epistemology. We come to believe in their theory of knowledge, which teaches that science is the only valuable thing and religion is meaningless nonsense. So the central problem that we face is that Think, we think that man created knowledge is superior to the word of God. So to resolve this problem, we have to understand that it is the heart, which is the core uh, for knowledge in Islamic tradition. That um, Imam Al-Ghazali said that when his aql and when his, when his reason and his observation were all uh, put into doubt and he fell into despair, then Allah Ta'ala illuminated his heart with knowledge. And this nur is the key to all knowledge. So, thus, uh, we have to recognize that the central battleground is that of knowledge. And today, our defeat is not uh, on, the, uh, on the fields of, with, with weapons. Our defeat today is on the battleground of knowledge. The West has defeated us on this battleground and we have accepted our defeat. And this is shameful because Allah Ta'ala gave us knowledge and they developed their own knowledge with their, with their own weak and feeble minds. And yet we accept their knowledge as being equal to or superior to the Quran. In, in economics, there are many, many 
situations where what the um, Western economics claims is directly in conflict with the Quran and our Islamic economists have rationalized uh, the Quran in order to fit to what Samuelson says. And this is what I mean by saying that we have lost on the battlefield of knowledge, but this is not, this is due to our own, um, our own inferiority complex. Actually, the knowledge that God has given us about how to build a society is far superior to anything that the West has developed over their three centuries. And if you look at the Western societies, you can look at how badly, in, in what a bad condition they are. So if their social science was worth anything, would their societies be like this, that in, uh, in the USA, there are millions of homeless and hungry people when they have enough wealth to feed the world? Today in the world as a whole, the amount of money spent on cosmetics is enough to feed all the hungry people on the planet. So this is the world that has been created by the social science that uh, the West has taught us. And social science is the key battleground. And deceived by the word science, we have sort of accepted the superiority of social science as uh, being equivalent to the physical sciences. And because we are so extremely impressed by the physical sciences and, and uh, their achievements in physical sciences are impressive, laptop, internet, everything they have developed. But we have to understand that the Hadith says that the, the Jal will have, one of the eyes will be very sharp. So the eye with respect to the external reality is very sharp. And with respect to internal reality of the hearts and souls of men, they are blind. They reject the existence of the heart and the soul. So, but the social science is built on the hearts and souls of men. And so we have to reject the social sciences and we have to rebuild social sciences on the basis of the Islamic intellectual tradition. And there are two common mistakes. Many people have recognized this. I'm not the first one to say this, but there are two common mistakes that are made. One is to say, okay, we need to rebuild. So we need to Islamize the Western social sciences. This cannot be done because they are built on the wrong foundations. So we cannot take the, um, the capitalist economics and make a little bit of trim to it. And like there is a famous formula that Islamic economics is equal to Capitalist economics plus zakat minus interest. So this is wrong. We cannot make little trims to Western social science to make it Islamic. We have to rebuild on new foundations. So, okay, so the one mistake is to just try to Islamize their knowledge. The second mistake is to say that, okay, what we need to do is to build on our own, uh, to, to just take the social science as it was developed by uh, by our, uh, our uh, philosophers, our intellectuals, our ulama over the past thousand centuries. So we cannot do that either because our ulama solved the problems of their own times using their own ijtihad. Today, we are in living in a new world. We need to apply uh, ijtihad to the new situations which never before existed on the planet. So we can't say that, okay, uh, Imam Malik said this about money. So we have these three fatawa, let's take one of these three, because the situation we face today is not the one that Imam Malik faced. If Imam Malik was living today, he would develop a new fatwa. So uh, I will try to end this with a joke, which was told to me in, um, uh, in Turkey that there was this um, invasion by the Greeks of Turkey. And so one of the Mashaikh was a great warrior. And um, one of the murid went to his grave and he made dua to this sheikh that, oh sheikh, uh, the Greeks are invading, so please get up and put on your arms and you are such a great warrior and help us in this battle. So the sheikh came up from the grave and slapped his murid. And he said, look, when we were fighting, we, we went and fought our own enemies. Now it is your time. You want a dead man to fight a living? You go and fight your own battles. So this is what we need to do. Today, we have to fight our own battles. We can't rely on Imam Malik and Imam Shafi. And, um, they fought their own battles. We have to fight these battles today. So some of the resources in which I have expanded more on what needs to be done. I have this Ulum al Umran, which is, provides an outline of how we can build uh, social sciences on foundations 
provided by Ibn Khaldun, not having to do with anything with the Western social sciences, building genuine Islamic financial institutions. Again, instead of taking Western institutions and modifying them, we can rebuild from scratch on new foundations. Islamic monetary policy, uh, again, this is uh, the, the theory of money in Islam is very different from the theory of money according to Western intellectuals, how to launch an Islamic revival based on the battlefield of knowledge. Um, and even I have a book, uh, I'm working on a course which is called Radical Statistics, Real Statistics. I've said, I've shown that even statistics is based on the wrong foundation. So statistics, it seems like it's a branch of mathematics, so it cannot have anything to do with morality. But even this is false. Statistics was created by uh, Fisher to prove his idea that Western people were superior. He was looking for the correlation between fathers and son and trying to prove that we are superior now and our, our race is superior to the other races. So this racist idea was the foundation of statistics. And if you get rid of this, you get to build statistics on an entirely new platform. So uh, I, have, I have about a book which is coming out, Islamic Economics, which is the polar opposite of capitalist economics. economics. This has been translated to Turkish and I'm working on Urdu translation. And so the capsule summary of this talk is that the structures of Western knowledge created over the past few centuries have been built on toxic foundations, rejection of God, afterlife, and day of judgment. We think that this doesn't matter, but these foundations do matter in terms of what the content of social sciences. And so we need to rebuild all of this knowledge on Islamic moral foundations. Okay, so let me end with a dua. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mati lillahi rabbil alameen. And may Allah Ta'ala fill our hearts with the nur of guidance and lead us from the darkness into the light as he has promised to do for the believers. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. All right, so that's the end of my talk. And now we can take questions. Uh, should I recognize the hands? Mujib, yes, you can. Um, okay. You are the first hand I see. Uh, Wa thank okay. you very much, uh, Dr. Asad Zaman, for a very thought-provoking lecture. Now, uh, time for question answer. So, first of all, I would like to invite Mujib uh, for his question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum wa salam. This is Mujib, senior lecturer at Rifa International mm -hmm. University. Uh, I have a question uh, relating to the, uh, the the process of getting knowledge in in in, for instance. Just Islamic speak closer to the mic uh, yeah. and louder. Yeah, sir. This is uh, Mujib, senior lecturer, at Rifa International University. I have yes. a question about uh, uh, the the method and ways of getting knowledge uh, in islamic social sciences so for instance in in <clears throat> in, in in western social sciences and other field as well there is well established research methods and ways of answering a certain questions so although they depend upon different philosophical positions epistemological positions and ontological positions so is there a first question is is there a need to develop some <clears throat> research methods in social sciences that are based on 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 Islamic philosophical positions and are absolutely any, any any research methods available in this context? Yes, I have given a number of talks on this issue. Uh, it's uh, summarized in my uh, link which I gave earlier that uh, how to develop ulum al umran according to Weber. Social sciences should be positive, a description of reality. They should not have any norms. This is completely false as a description of Western social science. It has a lot of concealed norms in it. And basically, we in Islamic world uh, have three categories, which I was described. We have the positive, which describes reality. Then we have the normative, which describes what the ideal society should look like. And then we have the transformative, how to get from here to there. 
So all three elements are essential parts of social science. Yes, we have an ideal society. Ideal society is like that of uh, any for a person. Ideal is like to be the, like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this ideal is not achievable. But does that mean that this ideal is useless? No, it gives us the direction. Just like the North Star cannot be achieved, but it gives us the direction for our struggle. So we can never achieve the ideal society, but it tells us what we need to do in order to move towards that direction. And in order to make that move, we also need to know where we are. And that is the positive element. So Islamic ulum al-umran will be based on all three elements, a positive element, a normative element, and a transformative element. And these last two are supposed to be missing, but actually Western social sciences also has all three elements, but they hide the normative and the transformative parts. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, next uh, we have Dr. Fakhrul Islam. Uh, so I would like to request uh, Professor Fakhrul Islam to ask his question. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Atiku Zafar Sahib, for giving me the opportunity. First of all, I would like to make a, a brief comment uh, and, uh, you know, appreciation for this thought-provoking lecture. Um, well, uh, uh, I think uh, there is no big difference uh, between the approach of uh, Muslims and, you know, non-Muslims on the question of natural sciences, except for some areas which are very limited. I mean, natural science is a fact which is accepted by all. But when it comes to the social sciences, and the worthy uh, speaker has, uh, you know, taken into account various aspects of the social sciences, this is an area which is the really sensitive and which needs our uh, proper attention. My question is that what should be the arrangement? I mean, would you like to uh, suggest uh, an international or regional organization to do that thing? Because, um, you know, it, it's not possible to develop social sciences from the perspective of Islam. Uh, in an individual capacity. Individual do, uh, you know, uh, have an importance, but unless it is a collective, you know, arrangement uh, on a regional basis or international basis, I think we may not realize the dream. So that's my question. Thank you. All right. This is a very important question. Uh, given that, first of all, Yani, there are uh, several stages. The first stage is to recognize, I mean, when I give this talk in many places, they say, no, no, you're talking through your hat. You're just saying nonsense. Uh, social science is just like physical science, which is their claim. And we cannot reject it all. There are some good parts and bad parts. The Prophet ﷺ made the khandaq. So we have to borrow from the West. And they, we have to recognize the reality that they are ahead of us and so on. So one part is to convince people that we have to reject it all. Okay, so... If we are on board on this, then there is the second part. As I said, there are three parts. There is the positive, normative, and transformative. So I did not talk about the transformative. Now, given that we understand that our present position is very bad, we are teaching poison to our children, and there is a real knowledge to be taught. Now, how do we make the change? Now, this is a very practical, nitty-gritty, down-to-earth decision because this is not a, this is not a, we, we don't, we are not free to move in any direction. There are very strong opposition parties who will try to prevent this move. So when we want to create, create for, for one thing, a lot of people with training in social sciences, uh, the professors and the teachers, they will say, no, I, I studied this economics for years and now you're telling me it's all zero. So they will try to oppose this. They will say that mostly it's useful. Yes, we, we can modify it. We can patch it up. We can get rid of interest. So uh, what should be the strategy to avoid this opposition, to overcome this opposition, to find our allies? This is like, a, I mean, I'm saying this is a battleground for knowledge and this has to be strategized. And there are many, many uh, elements of this strategy. And um, this is uh, something which needs to be discussed. 
um, and we have I have uh, had some discussions and we have developed some ideas on how to do it, but that would take another hour and a half at least. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have last question from Dr. Shiraz Aslam. He has joined it from Faisalabad. So I would like to request Shiraz Aslam to ask his question, please. Ji, Shiraz Aslam, can you hear us? Okay, if not, uh, then Mr. Umair. Okay. Want to ask I, I, oh, I think Shiraz just came online. Okay, yes, Shiraz. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is Shiraz from Faisalabad. I was a student of Islamic University. And um, uh, this is very enlightening uh, that we have started building social sciences. Um, I'm, uh, I really learned the positive, normative, and uh, transformative uh, side of the education today. And it is very important and thankful to Dr. Saab. Uh, basically, uh, uh, coming to the question of uh, Dr. Fakhar, uh, what are the practical steps? Uh, uh, I'm not there to add certain things, but I have an idea if, if you allow me to share. Uh, firstly, we can build small uh, uh, knowledge cards like dua cards or small booklets, which should be all uh, online or digital or in PDF formats which people could read in a, a five to 10 minutes knowledge or five to 10 minutes reading because people are very busy. Secondly, people, are, we have many friends who have specialization in different fields. For example, I have, wor I have worked in uh, management in Quran Hakim and uh, I can uh, uh, assist in this work uh, in uh, management and HR and marketing side. So we have experts in economics and finance and other areas. So uh, if it is possible that we can make small groups uh, as, as, as a planning or and it can be an online meeting of these specialized groups, then this can help a lot. Uh, the foundation uh, of the social sciences, as I am a, a management student and, and the teacher, so uh, basically, this is very important. Uh, Move closer uh, to the mic. Uh, yeah. Can we take it uh, subject wise and we can uh, divide it among students? Uh, economics is, is very important, uh, but more nearer uh, to our organizational setups and other is uh, the organizational management. And second, second important thing towards the profitability is our marketing side and to our organizational achievements is an HR side. So uh, those people, uh, those friends who has worked on their thesis or their PhDs in, in these different areas, uh, can they uh, assist uh, Docs up uh, in developing these things and can, can we make small uh, scholarly groups so that we can contribute to it. Uh, this is uh, my, uh, what my submissions were and uh, yeah. Uh, I'm very thankful that you have given me a time and it was very uh, enlightening for me to learn a lot of new things in this education. Uh, I'm serving uh, yes, and, uh, in ed educational institute now after my retirement from media. Uh, that is the Ames uh, Colleges and the Ames Schools. Uh, thank oh. you very much. Okay. Yes, uh, I think that the, the amount of work that needs to be done is enormous. Yani, we have millions of students all over the world studying poisonous ideas. And so to counter this, we need millions of different kinds of efforts. And so whatever you can do, uh, that would be, I think, valuable. Just even recognizing that the social science is not science and that uh, it is a way of organizing society. And we have our own ways of organizing society, which Islam teaches us. This is the core insight. And so today we are being taught, the medical students are being taught that you study medicine in order to earn money. And this is not Islam. You, earn, uh, you study medicine to save lives. And uh, he who has saved one life, it is as if he has saved all 
humanity. So you study medicine to please Allah Ta'ala and to earn great sawab. And similarly for all subjects. Our goal in studying should not be to get jobs. It should be to provide service to mankind. So once you start with that basic purpose, then the, all the other things will be worked out. And a huge amount of work is needed. So many, many different ideas are available. And actually, different people uh, have different capabilities and they should look at what I can do instead of waiting for the <coughs> government or the ulama or the XYZ to do something, international forum. You have in your uh, responsibility, you have in your contact circle people. So work on that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, inshallah, uh, we hope that our next uh, uh, lecture in this series will be around uh, management sciences. We have requested Professor Amanullah Khan to share his views in that area. So it will be more uh, of interest for Dr. Shiraz Aslam, inshallah. Uh, this Center for Peace and Global Studies was established a few years back and its main objective is to work for, uh, you can say, building uh, sciences on Islamic foundation. And uh, we have organized uh, many uh, activities and our main interest is development of textbooks, which can be, uh, which can be used as replacement for existing textbooks at various levels. So it is open invitation to all scholars who can uh, work for this purpose uh, should contribute and try to develop textbooks in different uh, areas of social sciences and center will provide every possible support in that area. So with this, uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Shahid, Muhammad Shahid to again take charge and conclude the session. Jazakumullah, <coughs> Dr. Teku Zafar. I must uh, thank and uh, pay gratitude to Dr. Asad Zama on his uh, very thought provoking lecture. Uh, there were some more uh, participants who wanted to um, put some questions, but before we are running short of time, uh, we are apologized uh, that we can't. Uh, uh, couldn't continue uh, the lecture more. Uh, I again thank you uh, very much and uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 before the beginning of this lecture uh, we were facing some problems uh, of uh, uh, road blockade and uh, 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 shortfall in uh, uh, electricity and uh, we <coughs> have arranged this lecture in uh, our uh, uh, organization of uh, medical doctors, uh, PIMA, Pakistan Islamic Medical Association. I must uh, express my gratitude to the team of PIMA to arrange this uh, lecture uh, on very emergency basis. So I must thank brother uh, Abdul Wadud and other team members of Pima Pakistan. Uh, once again, I thank Dr. Asad Zaman <coughs> on delivering this beautiful lecture today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for all. Wa alaikum wa